With Module 6, we finally arrived at perhaps the most important application of molecular thermodynamics, and that is to chemical reactions. Uh, you've probably been wondering why we haven't gotten here sooner, but uh, I think some of the things that we've uh, been looking at in the first five modules will have prepared us well for undertaking uh, this most important step. Now, uh, I want to uh, say a few words in general in this video about how one thinks about reactions thermodynamically. We'll then get into more details in some of the other videos, but this video will serve as a good foundation for what's to follow. Now, as chemists, we all know what a chemical reaction is, but I want you to begin thinking of it in thermodynamic terms. For example, in thermodynamics, we have distinguished lots of different change processes. Um, in the case of ideal gases, it might be a change process that just affected the physical properties of the gas, like pressure or volume. In the case of uh, phase transitions, it affected the physical state of the system. In the case of chemical reactions, um, we know that as a change process, it basically involves some set of chemical species that we call reactants, uh, eventually going to a different set of chemical species that we call products. And so we can think of um, a chemical reaction as basically involving going from an initial state, which is characterized by the reactants, to a final state, which is characterized by the products. All right, now, in this case, what we're talking about really is a composition change. So it is not a change necessarily in pressure or temperature or volume, um, but a change in the substances that make up the system. Now, we have looked at composition changes before. For example, when we talked about phase changes, uh, that involves a composition change, but we're changing uh, basically the same substance from one phase to another. The other thing I would say about phase changes is that there is no prescribed amount that can undergo that change. So um, I, I'm going to make a note of that here. No prescribed amount. And that is, we can change any amount. Um, any number of atoms can change from a solid to a liquid phase or from a liquid to a, va a vapor phase. Um, as a contrast, though, I want to mention that chemical reactions um, you can think of as being an organized compositional change. Now, what do I mean by that? All right, in the case of chemical reactions, uh, we're changing the composition, but we're doing so in a way uh, that is very regimented and very connected. Okay, and by connected, I mean that um, we're talking about the composition that changes in fixed proportions. So, let me make a note of that. Change is um, done in fixed proportions. And we're very used to that at this point in our studies because we've been dealing with chemical reactions and chemical equations quite a lot. And in fact, we know that a balanced chemical equation is one that tells us exactly what those fixed proportions are. So the balanced chemical equation basically details the proportions that different molecules are going to react with one another to form products. So uh, how do we distinguish this from our other thermodynamic properties? Well, temperature and pressure are also going to affect chemical reactions, but they're going to affect the physical process or physical properties of the process. So they're not going to have much to do with the proportions of the composition changes. They're just going to, uh, you know, for example, make the reaction go further or make the reaction go faster, but they're not going to change the relative proportions of things that change. All right, so how would we set this up in terms of our thermodynamics? I want you to consider the following general reaction, and uh, I'm going I'm to try to write this uh, so that it um, makes sense, but also allows us sort of the greatest uh, flexibility in uh, carrying it further. Okay, I'm going to use these kinds of numbers, that's a, a, an italics V, if you will, sub A, as the stoichiometric coefficient of chemical substance A. And that's going to combine with some number of B to produce some number of C and some number of D. All right, so these numbers, and I'll use alpha as sort of a general subscript to denote A, B, C, and D, these are my stoichiometric coefficients. So all of these are integers. 
And in fact, um, I'm going to insist that they are the smallest possible integers that will balance this equation. All right, so I should, I should have mentioned that this is a balanced equation. All right, you must start with a balanced equation, I and mean, you already, probably already do that, but you must start with a balanced equation whenever you talk about the thermodynamics of anything, because these stoichiometric coefficients are responsible for the relative proportions of all of these species. They cannot combine, they cannot react in different proportions. If they do, it represents a different chemical reaction. All right, these four things that I've denoted here, A, B, C, and D, I know this is very abstract, but these are different chemical species that are taking part in the reaction. Now, when I write something like this down, that doesn't mean this only applies to reactions with two reactants and two products. That may be among the more common uh, varieties, but this should apply in general to any number of reactants and any number of products. You would just have to expand the notation to accommodate the different species. Now, when we look at a reaction and we're concerned about the thermodynamics of the reaction, what are the kinds of thermodynamic uh, variables that we're going to care most about? What functions are we going to care most about? Well, I will tell you that right off the bat, the Gibbs energy is going to be the most important one that we have to worry about. Now, we won't worry about that immediately in the future, but I do want to talk a little bit about the Gibbs energy and how we treat it for a chemical reaction. Now, you'll recall that the Gibbs energy had two natural thermodynamic variables, and those were temperature and pressure. And after we have gone through the business of solutions, where we've noticed that composition changes also require us to take into account the number of moles of each substance, we're going to have to add some additional um, variables that the Gibbs energy for the reaction that I've just written down here would depend upon. It would depend upon the number of moles of each of my four reaction species. All right, And we know that this Gibbs energy is going to have something to do with spontaneity. So it's going to tell us if this reaction uh, takes place or not, whether it uh, goes in the forward direction or in some cases in the reverse direction. All right, so this Gibbs energy is going to turn out to be a very important quantity for us to reckon with as we talk about chemical reactions. Now, as uh, we've always seen, um, it's useful to find the total differential for this uh, particular quantity. And when we write it down for the Gibbs energy, we'll have the following terms included in, uh, in that uh, expression. So the differential for the Gibbs energy, I'll just remind you, it's minus SDT plus VDP. This is the result that we got uh, way back in module three. And now we're going to add the part that involves changes in the composition. And remember, those changes result from defining a chemical potential that would be related to the derivative of the Gibbs energy with respect to the moles of that uh, particular species and with all other numbers of moles held constant as well as temperature and pressure. So in other words, I'm going to have mu A times dNA, mu B times dNB, mu C times dNC, and mu D times dND. All right, so a lot that's been added here. and. Uh, I can tell you that the notation will quickly become very complicated if I have to write these things out every time. Instead, I'm going to use a sort of a shorthand for all of these things here. I'm going to write this simply as the sum over alpha mu alpha dn alpha. All right, so that will help me uh, shorten my notation a little bit, but the alpha stands for A, B, C, or D for each of the components, each of the constituents that occur in this reaction. Now I'll also note that most of the reactions we're going to care about take place at constant temperature and pressure. And when that's the case, if I have constant temperature and pressure, then these terms here are going to be equal to zero, and I won't have to worry about them at all. I'm only going to care about this part here that depends upon the chemical potentials and the changes in the moles of those various constituents. All right, now I want to introduce one other factor that will be important to us. As I'm writing down uh, the number, the change in the number of, uh, of moles of something, let me track 
how many moles there would be. So let's say for component alpha, so that could be A, B, C, or D, I'm going to have some initial number of moles present in the reaction mixture, and then it's going to change by some amount that I'll call DN alpha. And I don't need a zero there, just DN alpha. Now, I want to generalize DN alpha. It's got to follow the relative proportions that are given in the balanced chemical equation. So I need to somehow reflect that in the stoichiometric coefficients. So what I'm going to do is simply write this as N alpha zero, which is the initial number of moles, plus the stoichiometric coefficient for that particular substance times a, a quantity that I'm going to call sort of the incremental change in the reaction. So this incremental change is going to allow me to go through the reaction very slowly, one little bit at a time, and as I'm going through, I can evaluate the Gibbs energy change that goes with that. So this piece here is going to represent the change in the number of moles for component alpha. Now the other thing I want to uh, specify here is that we often let this new alpha be less than zero for reactants. So in other words, the reactants are going away, they're losing moles, so the, this is going to be reflected by having a negative sign in that stoichiometric coefficient, and nu of alpha will be greater than zero for products. So it means then that we can write our dg, I'm running out of room, but I'll try to get it in here, our dg can essentially be written as a sum over all of the components of the reaction times mu alpha times this stoichiometric coefficient with the sign added, negative if it's reactant, positive if it's product, dc. This Greek letter is c. It's like the Greek x. And so this is basically going to be uh, the sort of determining equation that we're going to use to detect uh, Gibbs energy changes as a reaction occurs. This particular quantity that's in parentheses is sometimes written as delta sub r g, and it also, it, it depends on where you look in the literature, but you can sometimes see it written or described as the reaction potential. Okay, so these are some basic ideas that we're going to utilize as we move forward in our study of chemical reactions, and this, uh, this uh, parameter C I should also identify. This is sometimes called the extent of the reaction. So in other words, it can vary from zero to whatever number, but going from zero to one would basically um, give us a molar Gibbs energy change for that reaction. But this extent of reaction will be an important quantity as we go forward.